Okay, we're back for Government and Natural Disasters Part 2. Or maybe I should have entitled these Lesson 3 lectures The Good News and the Bad News. There's good news, you ask. Well, right, we are talking about disaster, so good news is kind of a relative thing. Nonetheless, given the fact of disaster, the good news is that government can and does perform well in those disaster response roles for which it is institutionally well suited. In the last lecture, the important roles we put in that well-suited category included maintaining law and order and providing public goods, with the caveat that not all publicly provided goods and services are true public goods. And we said that on the whole, government in our country has performed these functions relatively well. So what's up with stuff like this? Quote, Bureaucracy has murdered people in the greater New Orleans area, so I'm asking Congress, please investigate this now. Take whatever idiot they have at the top of whatever agency and give me a better idiot. Give me a caring idiot. Give me a sensitive idiot. Just don't give me the same idiot. Yeah, that's the bad news. Now, it's not surprising that people's nerves get frayed, but I have to say that this particular quote took me right back to sophomores in my history classes because their default explanation for unhappy events was bad or stupid people doing bad or stupid things. And that's not such a satisfying answer. And what we'll hope to do in this lecture is to come up with a better one. We started lesson three by noting the widespread and strongly felt dissatisfaction with government response to Hurricane Katrina and asking if the public fury was justified. Given the perspective we've developed in the previous lectures, I'd suggest that one way to approach that question is through institutional analysis. What are the rules of the game? What incentives do those rules create? And how do those incentives influence the behavior of responders? Short in translation, are our expectations of government on target? The question, of course, suggests the answer. Public choice, the area of economics that studies government decision making, has identified key factors that explain why government cannot, as opposed to does not or will not, effectively perform the growing list of disaster relief tasks that it has taken on its citizens' direction over the last century. First and foremost is the information problem so eloquently described by Frederick von Hayek. In lesson two, we established that market institutions are uniquely suited to overcoming this problem. Prices transmit the necessary information to decision makers very effectively, and incentives in the market encourage buyer and seller behavior that mitigates the impact of the disaster. That's good news. The bad news is that government, no matter how well-intentioned the officials, no matter how big, no matter how powerful, cannot do that job as well as markets can. And it's the rules of the game, not the character or intelligence or compassion of the players that doom centralized disaster response. Note how Mercatus Center economist Russ Sobel and Pete Leeson's framing of the disaster relief reveals the market nature of the problem. They argue that natural disaster management is no different in this regard than coordinating individuals in normal economic contexts. Following a natural disaster, there are relief demanders, that is, individuals who desperately need relief supplies, including evacuation, food, water, shelter, medical attention, etc. On the other side, there are relief suppliers, individuals ready and willing to bring their supplies and expertise to bear on the needs of the relief demanders. On both sides of this market, information is decentralized, local, and often inarticulate. Relief demanders know when relief is needed, what they need, and in what quantities, but not necessarily who has the relief supplies they require or how to obtain them. Similarly, relief suppliers know what relief supplies they have and how they can help, but they may be largely unaware of whether relief is required and if it is, what's needed, by whom, in what locations and quantities. And Market institutions, as we saw in Lesson 2, are pr primed to respond, putting prices to work to coordinate the activities of relief demanders and suppliers. Government, on the other hand, substitutes centralized direction for prices, and that doesn't work so well. 
History is replete with examples of how poorly centralized institutions transmit information, the Soviet Union being only the most recently memorable. Public choice analysis shows us why this and other failures of centralization are a function of structure rather than of execution. There's no mechanism in government institutions that can perform the information transmission function that prices perform in markets. Government proceeds by searching for and gathering information and then transmitting it to a central authority for analysis. This time-consuming process constrains decision-making in even the best of times, and it becomes overwhelming when disaster further fragments local knowledge. And the problem is further exacerbated by the likelihood that the people most familiar with the local conditions, needs, and available resources are not the decision makers. And speaking of decision makers, I don't think that we can say too often or too forcefully that government disaster response difficulties are systemic rather than failures or inadequacies of individuals. The knowledge problem bedevils all centralized decision making, no less that of the 21st century FEMA than of 20th century Soviet Union. And the analysts caution us. Replacing Stalin with Mother Teresa or Albert Einstein would have been no more help for the Soviet economy than replacing Michael Brown or the current FEMA director with one of these individuals would be. Which brings us back to Hayek. It's not that government is unwilling or inept, although certainly there are unwilling and inept people in government, as in all walks of life. The point for us in seeking to understand the apparent failures in responding to natural disasters like Hurricane Katrina is that government is incapable of overcoming the obstacle of dispersed information. It doesn't have the tools. The institutional rules of the game are not designed to perform that task. Government's efficacy in disaster relief is further constrained by bureaucracy, the operating mechanism by which centrally directed institutions tie government officials and workers to goals that have been identified through the political process. We rail against democracy all the time, but public choice scholar Gordon Tullock has argued that bureaucracy is effective in creating incentives in the non-market government setting and may in fact be necessary to the function of government. Bureaucratic rules of the game, including detailed procedures, strict protocols, line of command decision making, create incentives for subordinates to behave as their superiors want them to. Employees are rewarded for following procedures and punished when they do not. Risk taking is discouraged. The rewards for successful risks are small and the costs of failure are extremely high. Despite its benefits, however, this bureaucratic institutional structure is not well suited to dealing with rapid changes in the particular circumstances of time and place, the old knowledge problem. Inevitably then, bureaucracy slows government response to disaster, often agonizingly so. And because it's easier to blame a person than an institution, government officials become the targets of citizens' impatience. Note, for example, the fate of the hapless officials who became the butt of jokes as New Orleans flooded. Although the media, companies like Walmart, and pretty much the whole world were aware of the impending hurricane strike, key government officials in the United States acted like they were not. The Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, Michael Chertoff, didn't declare Hurricane Katrina an incident of national significance until 36 hours after it made landfall. Why? Well, suggesting that they weren't smart enough to turn on the TV may vent our frustration, but it doesn't go very far as an explanation that we can learn from. The real story lies in the rules of the game that are intended to safeguard the public purse. By law, FEMA can't act until there has been an official declaration of disaster by the president. A request for a disaster declaration can't get to the president until a hierarchy of officials signs off on the protocols. Quote, from the view of political actors charged with relieving disaster, there is no disaster to respond to until the president, who has reached in the final stage of the bureaucratic procedure, has officially declared as much. This is true even if a disaster requiring assistance has already struck. 
the disaster is readily acknowledged and visible in the media. Unavoidable bureaucracy inherent to government management creates a separation between what might be called private knowledge of disaster and political knowledge of the same disaster." End quote. So, as a private citizen, Michael Chertoff may have known about the hurricane, but as head of Homeland Security, he didn't have the political knowledge until it reached him via the procedures and protocols specified for a disaster declaration. And then, note the map of the declaration. That the hurricane path here is delineated by neat county boundaries further reveals that institutional rules of the game are those of government. The next hurdle in the way of effective government response, there's no feedback mechanism to gauge whether relief efforts are meeting the needs of the disaster victims. In markets, price and the profit motive work together to rapidly transmit direct feedback from the consumer or disaster victim back to the suppliers of disaster relief supplies. Government, however, can only get feedback indirectly through the political process and media and hardly in a timely manner appropriate to disaster response. Most of us heard, for example, that FEMA purchased 95,000 trailers, put some in places so remote that they stayed empty, and then, oh, by the way, discovered formaldehyde contamination, all at taxpayer expense. The outline you'll read for the assignments contains other stories, including the wandering truckloads of ice that ended up as far away as Portland, Maine, or in the polar bear cage at the Tucson Zoo in Arizona. Now, despite the delight such stories occasioned the late-night talk show hosts, they're best explained by incentives, rather than as evidence that government workers are stupid or don't care. The point here is that, unlike private firms, Government agencies don't have strong incentives to get it right when it comes to providing disaster relief products. While it's certainly true that private firms also make mistakes, the key point is that they bear costs for their mistakes, and so they have an incentive to avoid them next time. FEMA does not. Having to donate misallocated ice to polar bears would reduce profits for a private supplier, and that's a strong incentive to improve procedures. FEMA officials face no such incentive. Okay, we respond, but you'd think they'd learn. Well, think that through. Efforts to learn from past mistakes are doomed by that same lack of feedback and the ever-changing specifics of time, place, and event. It's not that government workers don't try. For example, Florida's emergency management officials tried to learn from Hurricane Katrina in 2005 so they stocked up on ice for the 2006 hurricane season. And then they were vilified in the press when no hurricanes hit and the bill for storing the ice was publicized. Another characteristic of government disaster relief efforts is increasingly poor resource allocation as the effort goes on. Again, looking at institutional incentives helps us to explain this phenomenon. People in the public sector, like those in the private sector, make rational decisions in their self-interest. A key insight of public choice theory is that if those public sector workers are elected, they must first define their self-interest in terms of getting into or staying in office. They can't accomplish their goals, no matter how patriotic those goals may be, if they lose the election. This means they have a strong incentive to be responsive to those who can most affect their political tenure. And, the result is that as relief efforts stretch on, resources tend to be more and more politically allocated. Appointed government workers are no less subject to this perverse incentive structure. Their civil service salaries are unaffected by how they respond to the disaster. In fact, if they're salaried rather than hourly employees, putting in extra effort during an emergency is costly to them. And while compassion's an incentive for a little while, it tends to wear thin pretty quickly once the immediate, immediate emergency has passed. Add to that the incentives of the bureaucratic structure. Employees are commended for following procedures and documenting steps carefully. They're criticized and may be reprimanded for skipping steps, trying to be creative, or taking risks. These are not the incentives that would encourage innovation or speed up disaster response. And, in addition to slowing down response, these incentives also promote what are known as type 2 errors. 
analysts recognize two types of policy errors. Very creatively, they are called type 1 and type 2 errors. Type 1 errors result from too little ca caution. And type 2 errors result from too much. As we look at the incentives, it's not hard to predict that FEMA and bureaucracies in general are particularly prone to type 2 errors. Think about the nature of these errors. Type 1 tend to be highly visible, while type 2 are not. So if FEMA waits too long to enter a disaster zone, it may be blamed for acting too slowly, as it was in the case of Katrina. But that blame is likely to be less than what FEMA might receive if it entered a disaster zone immediately before a plan was worked out and consequently bungled its relief effort in a more overt fashion. FEMA has an incentive to delay action even if more disaster victims are harmed by its not entering than would be harmed if it entered prematurely. Victims lost before FEMA enters because it delays action are less obviously linked to that lack of action. Given this reward and reprimand structure, the tendency for disaster relief bureaucracies to commit type 2 errors is not surprising, but that still doesn't make it good news for the victims. The late Nobel laureate Milton Friedman suggested that agencies like FEMA are also subject to what's called the other people's money syndrome. Look at the chart on the screen. And you can see that the two variables are whose money are you spending and who are you spending it on, which allows for a total of four possible combinations. There's a more detailed explanation in the reading for this lesson, but we can summarize by saying that type one spending, you're using your own money to buy something for yourself. So it's characterized by strong incentives to get the most value for your money. Those same incentives are weak or missing in type 4 spending, where you're using someone else's money to buy something for another person. FEMA disaster relief programs are type 4 spending, meaning the ice for polar bear stories probably shouldn't surprise us. Finally, and unfortunately, on the government side of the ledger, there appears to be a strong connection between the availability of federal disaster relief money and public corruption. A study of public corruption between 1990 and 2002 revealed that states with more natural disasters had more public corruption convictions. The researchers attribute the increase to the new opportunities for bribery that disaster relief windfalls open up through kickbacks for granting contracts or skimming of relief funds and to the chaos that provides some cover for shady dealings. I'll pause for a minute to let you read the screen. Okay, let's switch perspective for a minute and look at the other actor in the disaster situation, the victims. The escalating real cost of government disaster programs is a consequence of incentives facing disaster victims in the form of what are called moral hazards and Good Samaritan effects. Moral hazards exist when people don't bear the full cost of risky behavior, and therefore they do more of it. Moral hazards occur in both the private and the public sector. In the private sector, for example, auto insurance reduces the cost of driving a little bit faster or a little more carelessly. However, the profit motives gives insurance companies an incentive to try to reduce that hazard by requiring driver safety classes or offering good driver discounts, for example. That's not the case in the public sector. Absent the profit motive, government has no incentive to reduce moral hazards. Thus, for example, federal flood insurance lowers the cost of building and rebuilding homes in flood-prone areas. And so people have literally been flooding into floodplains while the real cost of the federal flood insurance program, costs paid by taxpayers, continue to grow. While moral hazards encourage people to take more risks, one way to look at Good Samaritan effects is that they discourage people from taking risks 
even the ultimately necessary ones of making the effort to return to normal life and get back on their feet after a disaster. If generous disaster assistance is available, it's certainly rational to accept it and costly not to. So it's what your mom used to call too much of a good thing. On the screen, you'll see what happened because people living in floodplains have come to expect that they will be bailed out. Along the Gulf Coast after Katrina, Good Samaritan effects of prolonged disaster relief created what has been referred to as the FEMA economy. Many New Orleans business owners were frustrated in their efforts to reopen because they couldn't get workers, even at higher than normal wages, in part because the government repeatedly extended unemployment benefits. Or businesses found that they simply couldn't compete with the extended offering of relief supplies at zero price. As one astute Mississippi resident observed, there's no reason for a business to open up that provides any kind of food service if right down the street you can get food for free. The underlying problem is one of unintended consequences. The critical analysis of government response offered here is not intended to reduce compassion for the victims, nor, as we repeatedly said, is it an indictment of the character or intelligence of the people directing and working for FEMA and other government relief agencies. It is, however, a pointed suggestion that publicly, publicly expressing our compassion doesn't guarantee results. The evidence clearly indicates that no matter how well-intentioned government financed assistance beyond the immediate emergency needs of maintaining law and order and providing true public goods is not only ineffective, but in fact hampers the recovery process. We asked at the beginning of lesson three whether public fury in the wake of disaster is justified. And that opens the door to considering whether in fact the problem lies in our expectations. Is it possible that we're asking of government something it's not capable of doing. In closing then, let me suggest that while government's ineptitude during natural disasters may be good fodder for comedians and radio talk show hosts, it may be more important as a signal to adjust our expectations. Throughout the 20th century, we demanded that government take on more and more responsibility for citizens' well-being with relatively little consideration of whether or not political institutions are inherently capable of meeting that lengthening list of expectations. The tendency to think that big problems like natural catastrophes can best be dealt with by big institutions like government is understandable, but persisting in that belief in the face of continuing evidence to the contrary is not. If we expect governments to perform functions for which they don't have the necessary knowledge, incentives, and mechanisms, we not only invite disappointment, but we risk undermining our ability to perform the vital tasks for which governments were created. Restoring civil order, maintaining the rule of law, and providing those few true public goods necessary for other economic and social institutions to operate. We've thrown a lot of new material at you in this lecture. The summary of the main points or big ideas probably doesn't do them justice, but I hope that the lesson outline you'll read in the assignments will serve as a good review. It includes a number of case studies and examples that should help you assimilate the concepts. And later, when you return for lesson four, we'll complete our institutional analysis by considering how nonprofits function in disaster relief.